Section 1. Hello, Tourist Information Center. Mike speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I wanted to find out about cookery classes. I believe there are some one-day classes for tourists. Well, they're open to everyone, but tourists are always welcome. OK, let me give you some details of what's available. There are several classes. One very popular one is at the food studio. OK. They focus on seasonal products, and as well as teaching you how to cook them, they also show you how to choose them. Right, that sounds good. How big are the classes? I'm not sure exactly, but they'll be quite small. And could I get a private lesson there? I think so. Let me check. Yes, they do offer those. Though, in fact, most of the people who attend the classes find it's a nice way of getting to know one another. I suppose it must be, yes. And this company has a special deal for clients where they offer a discount of 20% if you return for a further class. OK, but you said there were several classes. That's right. Another one you might be interested in is Bond's Cookery School. They're quite new. They just opened six months ago, but I've heard good things about them. They concentrate on teaching you to prepare healthy food, and they have quite a lot of specialist staff. So, is that food for people on a diet and things like that? I don't know if I'd be interested in that. Well, I don't think they particularly focus on low-calorie diets or weight loss. It's more to do with recipes that look at specific needs, like including ingredients that will help build up your bones and make them stronger, that sort of thing. I see. Well, I might be interested. I'm not sure. Do they have a website I could check? Yes. Just key in the name of the school. It'll come up. And if you want to know more about them, every Thursday evening they have a lecture at the school. It's free, and you don't need to book or anything. Just turn up at 7.30. And that might give you an idea of whether you want to go to an actual class. OK, there's one more place you might be interested in. That's got a rather strange name. It's called the Aretza Centre. That's spelled A double R E T S A. OK. They've got a very good reputation. They do a bit of meat and fish cookery, but they mostly specialise in vegetarian dishes. Right. That's certainly an area I'd like to learn more about. I've got lots of friends who don't eat meat. In fact, I think I might have seen that school today. Is it just by the market? That's right. So they don't have any problem getting their ingredients. They're right next door. And they also offer a special two-hour course in how to use a knife. They cover all the different skills, buying them, sharpening, chopping techniques. It gets booked up quickly, though, so you'd need to check it was available. Right. Well, thank you very much. I'll go and check that out. That is... Section 2. Good evening, everyone. My name's Phil Sutton, and I'm chairman of the Highways Committee. We've called this meeting to inform members of the public about the new regulations for traffic and parking we're proposing for Granford. I'll start by summarising these changes before we open the meeting to questions. So, why do we need to make these changes to traffic systems in Granford? Well, we're very aware that traffic is becoming an increasing problem. It's been especially noticeable with the increase in heavy traffic while they've been building the new hospital. But it's the overall rise in the volume of traffic of all kinds that's concerning us. To date, there's not been any increase in traffic accidents but that's not something we want to see happen, obviously. We recently carried out a survey of local residents and their responses were interesting. People were very concerned about the lack of visibility on some roads due to cars parked along the sides of the roads. We'd expected complaints about the congestion near the school when parents are dropping off their children or picking them up. But this was on top of the list and nor were noise and fumes from trucks and lorries, though they were mentioned by some people. We think these new traffic regulations would make a lot of difference. 
but we still have a long way to go. We've managed to keep our proposals within budget, just, so they can be covered by the Council. But, of course, it's no good introducing new regulations if we don't have a way of making sure that everyone obeys them. And that's an area we're still working on with the help of representatives from the police force. OK, so this slide shows a map of the central area of Granford with the high street in the middle and school road on the right. Now, we already have a set of traffic lights in the high street at the junction with Station Road, but we're planning to have another set at the other end, at the school road junction. Visibility for drivers and pedestrians, especially on the bend just to the north of the school. As far as disabled drivers are concerned, at present they have parking outside the supermarket, but lorries also use those spaces, so we've got two new disabled parking spaces on the side road up towards the bank. It's not ideal, but probably better than the present arrangement. We also plan to widen the pavement on School Road. We think we can manage to get an extra half metre on the bend just before you get to the school, on the same side of the road. Finally, we've introduced new restrictions on loading and unloading for the supermarket, so lorries will only be allowed to stop there before 8am. That's the supermarket on School Road. We kept to the existing arrangements with the High Street supermarket. OK, so that's about it. Now, would you like... Section 3 We've got to choose a topic for our experiment, haven't we, Jack? Were you thinking of something to do with seeds? Mm, that's right. I thought we could look at seed germination, how a seed begins to grow. OK. Any particular reason? I know you're hoping to work in plant science eventually. Yeah, but practically everything we do is going to feed into that. No, there's an optional module on seed structure and function in the third year that I might do. So I thought it might be useful for that. If I choose that option, I don't have to do a dissertation module. Good idea. <laughs> well, I thought for this experiment we could look at the relationship between seed size and the way the seeds are planted, so we could plant different sized seeds in different ways and see which grow best. OK. We'd need to allow time for the seeds to come up. That should be fine if we start now. A lot of the other possible experiments need quite a bit longer. So that'd make it a good one to choose. And I don't suppose it'd need much equipment. We're not doing chemical analysis or anything. Though that's not really an issue. We've got plenty of equipment in the laboratory. Yeah, we need to have a word with the tutor if we're going to go ahead with it, though. I'm sure our aim's OK. It's not very ambitious, but the assignment's only 10% of our final mark, isn't it? But we need to be sure we're the only ones doing it. Yeah, it's only 5%, actually. But it'd be a bit boring if everyone was doing it. Did you read that book on seed germination on our reading list? The one by Graves? Hmm. I looked through it for my last experiment, though it wasn't all that relevant there. It would be for this experiment, though. I found it quite hard to follow... Lots about the theory, which I hadn't expected. Yes, I'd been hoping for something more practical. It does include references to the recent findings on genetically modified seeds, though. Yes, that was interesting. I read an article about seed germination by Lee Hall. About seeds that lie in the ground for ages and only germinate after a fire. Hmm, that's the one. I knew a bit about it already, but not about this research. His analysis of figures comparing the times of the fires and the proportion of seeds that germinated was done in a lot of detail. Very impressive. Was that the article with the illustrations of early stages of plant development? They were very clear. I think those diagrams were in another article.
Anyway, shall we have a look at the procedure for our experiment? We'll need to get going with it quite soon. Right. So the first thing we have to do is find our seeds. I think vegetable seeds would be best, and obviously they mustn't all be the same size. So how many sorts do we need? About four different ones? I think that would be enough. There'll be quite a large number of seeds for each one. Then for each seed, we need to find out how much it weighs and also measure its dimensions. And we need to keep a careful record of all that. That'll be quite time-consuming. And we also need to decide how deep we're going to plant the seeds, right on the surface a few millimetres down or several centimetres. OK, so then we get plum what the weather's like. Then we see if our plants have come up and write down how tall they've grown. Then all we have to do is look at our numbers and see if there's any relation between them. That's right. So then we get... Section 4 Hi. Today we're going to be looking at animals in urban environments. And I'm going to be telling you about some research on how they're affected by these environments. Now, in evolutionary terms, urban environments represent huge upheavals, the sorts of massive changes that usually happen over millions of years. And we used to think that only a few species could adapt to this new environment. One species which is well known as being highly adaptable is the crow, and there have been various studies about how they manage to learn new skills. Another successful species is the pigeon, because they're able to perch on ledges on the walls of city buildings, just like they once perched on cliffs by the sea. But, in fact, we're now finding that these early immigrants were just the start of a more general movement of animals into cities, and of adaptation by these animals to city life. And one thing that researchers are finding especially interesting is the speed with which they're doing this. We're not talking about gradual evolution here. These animals are changing fast. Let me tell you about some of the studies that have been carried out in this area. So, in the University of Minnesota, a biologist called Emily Snellrude and her colleagues looked at specimens of urbanized small mammals, such as mice and gophers, that had been collected in Minnesota, and that are now kept in museums there. And she looked at specimens that had been collected over the last hundred years, which is a very short time in evolutionary terms. And she found that during that time, these small mammals had experienced a jump in brain size when compared to rural mammals. Now, we can't be sure this means they're more intelligent, but since the sizes of other parts of the body didn't change, it does suggest that something cognitive was going on. And Snellrood thinks that this change might reflect the cognitive demands of adjusting to city life, having to look in different places to find food, for example, and coping with a whole new set of dangers. Then over in Germany, at the Max Planck Institute, there's another biologist called Katerina Miranda, who's done some experiments with blackbirds living in urban and rural areas. And she's been looking not at their anatomy, but at their behavior. So, as you might expect, she's found that the urban blackbirds tend to be quite bold. They're prepared to face up to a lot of threats that would frighten away their country counterparts. But there's one type of situation that does seem to frighten the urban blackbirds. And that's anything new, anything they haven't experienced before. And if you think about it, that's quite sensible for a bird living in the city. Jonathan Atwell, in Indiana University, is looking at how a range of animals respond to urban environments. He's found that when they're under stress, their endocrine systems react by reducing the amount of hormones such as corticosterone into their blood. It's a sensible-seeming adaptation. A rat that gets scared every time a subway train rolls past 
won't be very successful. There's just one more study I'd like to mention, which is by Sarah Parton and her team. And they've been looking at how squirrels communicate in an urban environment, and they've found that a routine part of their communication is carried out by waving their tails. You do also see this in the country, but it's much more prevalent in cities, possibly because it's effective in a noisy environment. So, what are the long-term implications of this? One possibility is that we may see completely new species developing in cities. But on the other hand, it's possible that not all of these adaptations will be permanent. Once the animals got accustomed to its new environment, it may no longer need the features it's developed. So, now we've had a look at adaptation... Section 1. Hello, South City Cycling Club. Oh, hi. Um, I want to find out about joining the club. Right, I can help you there. I'm the club secretary and my name's Jim Hunter. Oh, hi, Jim. So, are you interested in membership for yourself? That's right. OK, well, there are basically two types of adult membership. If you're pretty serious about cycling, there's the full membership. That costs $260, and that covers you not just for ordinary cycling, but also for races, both here in the city and also in other parts of Australia. Right. Well, I'm not really up to that standard. I was more interested in just joining a group to do some cycling in my free time. Sure. That's why most people join. So, in that case, you'd be better with the recreational membership. That's $108 if you're over 19 and $95 if you're under. I'm 25. OK. It's paid quarterly and you can upgrade it later to the full membership if you want to, of course. Now, both types of membership include the club fee of $20. They also provide insurance in case you have an accident, though we hope you won't need that, of course. No. OK. Well, I'll go with the recreational membership, I think, and that allows me to join in the club activities and so on? That's right. And once you're a member of the club, you're also permitted to wear our kit when you're out cycling. It's green and white. Yes, I've seen cyclists wearing it. So can I buy that at the club? Uh, no, it's made to order by a company in Brisbane. You can find them online. They're called Jerry's. That's J-E-R-R-I-Z. You can use your membership number to put in an order on their website. OK. Now, can you tell me a bit about the rides I can do? Sure. So, we have training rides pretty well every morning, and they're a really good way of improving your cycling skills as well as your general level of fitness, but they're different levels. Level A is pretty fast. You're looking at about 30 or 35 kilometres an hour. If you can do about 25 kilometres an hour, you'd probably be level B, and then level C are the novices who stay at about 15 kilometres per hour. Right. Well, I reckon I'd be level B. So when are the sessions for that level? Uh, there are a couple each week. They're both early morning sessions. There's one on Tuesdays, and for that one you meet at 5.30am, and the meeting point's the stadium. Do you know where that is? Yes, it's quite near my home, in fact. OK, and how about the other one? That's on Thursdays. It starts at the same time, but they meet at the main gate to the park. Is that the one just past the shopping mall? That's it. So how long are the rides? Uh, they're about an hour and a half, so if you have a job, it's easy to fit in before you go to work. And the members often go somewhere for coffee afterwards, so it's quite a social event. OK, that sounds good. 
I've only just moved to the city, so I don't actually know many people yet. Well, it's a great way to meet people. And does each ride have a leader? Sometimes, but not always. But you don't really need one. The group members on the ride support one another anyway. How would we know where to go? If you check the club website, you'll see that the route for each ride is clearly marked. So you can just print that out and take it along with you. It's similar from one week to another, but it's not always exactly the same. And what do I need to bring? Hmm, well, bring a bottle of water and your phone. You shouldn't use it while you're cycling, but have it with you. Right. And in winter, it's well before sunrise when we set out, so you need to make sure your bike's got lights. That's OK. Well, thanks, Jim. I'd definitely like to join. So what's the best way of going about it? Ah, uh, you can... Section 2 Thanks for coming, everyone. OK, so this meeting is for new staff and staff who haven't been involved with our volunteering projects yet. So, basically, the idea is that we allow staff to give up some of their work time to help on various charity projects to benefit the local community. We've been doing this for the last five years, and it's been very successful. Participating doesn't necessarily involve a huge time commitment. The company will pay for eight hours of your time. That can be used over one or two days all at once or spread over several months throughout the year. There are some staff who enjoy volunteering so much, they also give up their own free time for a couple of hours every week. It's completely up to you. Obviously, Many people will have family commitments and aren't as available as other members of staff. Feedback from staff has been overwhelmingly positive. Because they felt they were doing something really useful, nearly everyone agreed that volunteering made them feel more motivated at work. They also liked building relationships with the people in the local community and felt valued by them. One or two people also said it was a good thing to have on their CVs. One particularly successful project last year was the Get Working project. This was aimed at helping unemployed people in the area get back to work. Our staff were able to help them improve their telephone skills, such as writing down messages and speaking with confidence to potential customers, which they had found quite difficult. This is something many employers look for in job applicants and something we all do without even thinking about every day at work. We've got an exciting new project starting this year. Up until now, we've mainly focused on projects to do with education and training, and we'll continue with our reading project in schools and our work with local charities. But we've also agreed to help out on a conservation project in Redfern Park. So if any of you fancy being outside and getting your hands dirty, this is the project for you. I also wanted to mention the annual Digital Inclusion Day, which is coming up next month. The aim of this is to help older people keep up with technology. And this year, instead of hosting the event in our own training facility, we're using the ICT suite at Hill College, as it can hold far more people. We've invited over 60 people from the Silver Age Community Center to take part, so we'll need a lot of volunteers to help with this event. If you're interested in taking part, please go to the volunteering section of our website and complete the relevant form. We won't be providing any training for this, but you'll be paired with an experienced volunteer if you've never done it before. By the way, don't forget to tell your manager about any volunteering activities you decide to do. The participants on the Digital Inclusion Day really benefited. The majority were in their 70s, though some were younger, and a few were even in their 90s. Quite a few owned both a computer and a mobile phone, but these tended to be outdated models. They generally knew how to do simple things like send texts, but weren't aware of recent developments in mobile phone technology. 
A few were keen to learn, but most were quite dismissive at first. They couldn't see the point of updating their skills. But that soon changed. The feedback was very positive. The really encouraging thing was that participants all said they felt much more confident about using social media to keep in touch with their grandchildren, who prefer this form of communication to phoning or sending emails. A lot of them also said playing online games would help them make new friends and keep their brains active. They weren't that impressed with being able to order their groceries online, as they liked going out to the shops, but some said it would come in handy if they were ill or the weather was really bad. One thing they asked about was using tablets for things like reading newspapers. Some people had been given tablets as presents, but had never used them. So that's something we'll make sure we include this time. Section 3 uh, come in, Russ. Thank you. Now, you wanted to consult me about your class presentation on nanotechnology. You're due to give it next week, aren't you? That's right, and I'm really struggling. I chose the topic because I didn't know much about it and wanted to learn more, but now I've read so much about it, in a way there's too much to say. I could talk for much longer than the 20 minutes I've been allocated. Should I assume the other students don't know much and give them a kind of general introduction? Or should I try and make them share my fascination with a particular aspect? You could do either, but you'll need to have it clear in your own mind. Then I think I'll give an overview. OK. Now, one way of approaching this is to work through developments in chronological order. Uh-huh. On the other hand, you could talk about the numerous ways that nanotechnology is being applied. You mean things like thin films on camera displays to make them water repellent and additives to make motorcycle helmets stronger and lighter? Exactly. Or another way would be to focus on its impact in one particular area, say medicine or space exploration. That would make it easier to focus. Perhaps I should do that. I think that would be a good idea. Right. How important is it to include slides in the presentation? They aren't essential by any means. And there's a danger of tailoring what you say to fit whatever slides you can find. While it can be good to include slides, you could end up spending too long looking for suitable ones. You might find it better to leave them out. I see. Another thing I was wondering about was how to start. I know presentations often begin with, first I'm going to talk about this, and then I'll talk about that. But I thought about asking the audience what they know about nanotechnology. That would be fine if you had an hour or two for the presentation, but you might find that you can't do anything with the answers you get, and it simply eats into the short time that's available. So maybe I should mention a particular way that nanotechnology is used to focus people's attention. That sounds sensible. What do you think I should do next? I really have to plan the presentation today and tomorrow. Well, initially, I think you should ignore all the notes you've made, take a small piece of paper and write a single short sentence that ties together the whole presentation. It can be something as simple as, nanotechnology is already improving our lives. Then start planning the content around that, you can always modify that sentence later if you need to. OK. Before you hear the... OK, now let's think about actually giving the presentation. You've only given one before, if I remember correctly, about an experiment you'd been involved in. That's right. It was pretty rubbish. Let's say it was better in some respects than in others. With regard to the structure, I felt that you ended rather abruptly, without rounding it off. Be careful not to do that in next week's presentation. OK. And you made very little eye contact with the audience because you were looking down at your notes most of the time. You need to be looking at the audience and only occasionally glancing at your notes. Mm. Your body language was a little odd. Every time you showed a slide, you turned your back on the audience so you could look at it. You should have been looking at your laptop. And you kept scratching your head, so I found myself wondering when you were next going to do that. 
instead of listening to what you were saying. Oh, dear. What did you think of the language? I knew that not everyone was familiar with the subject, so I tried to make it as simple as I could. Yes, that came across. You used a few words that are specific to the field, but you always explained what they meant, so the audience wouldn't have had any difficulty understanding. Uh-huh. I must say, the handouts you prepared were well thought out. They were a good summary of your presentation, which people would have been able to refer to later on. So well done on that. Thank you. Well, I hope that helps you with next week's presentation. Yes, it will. Thanks a lot. I'll look forward to seeing a big improvement then.